You're listening to The Journey Podcast. What transformation awaits at the intersection of resilience and the human spirit's capacity to heal? Stay tuned for today's episode. This episode contains adult subject matter and some listeners may be triggered by this content. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Petra Brunbauer, and with decades of experience with sadness, pain, anxiety, and stress, I finally figured out how to leave all that behind. And this podcast shows you how to break free permanently so you can reclaim your sanity and find the self-esteem and energy to go after the life you desire. With real talk about mental health, holistic healing, and the tough journey of coming out the other end, this is The Journey Podcast. Welcome to today's episode, which is part of a special series from Mental Health Awareness Week in the UK. In this episode, we explore the journey from depression to recovery, focusing on the transformative process of moving through dark times into a place of hope and renewal. We delve into the personal experiences that teach us resilience, the importance of self-compassion, and the steps we can take to rebuild our lives. Highlighting the crucial role of self-care and supportive relationships, we share perspectives on overcoming the challenges that depression brings and the pathways that lead to healing. Rachel Kelly is a best-selling writer, public speaker, and mental health advocate. She writes regularly for the press and gives TV and radio interviews to help educate and break down the stigma around mental illness in her role as an ambassador for several mental health charities. She also shares evidence-based strategies on how to stay calm and well and is the author of five books covering her experience of depression and recovery and her steps to well-being from poetry to nutrition. Rachel speaks at events and well-being workshops, sharing her motivational and holistic approach to good mental health. She is an official ambassador for Rethink Mental Illness, Head Talks, SANE, and the Counseling Foundation. Her books include her memoir, Black Rainbow, about her expression of depression, and four subsequent books about her recovery and how to stay calm and well, Walking on Sunshine, 52 Small Steps to Happiness, The Happy Kitchen, Good Mood Food, and Singing in the Rain, an inspirational workbook. Her latest book is You'll Never Walk Alone, Poems for Life's Ups and Downs, published in 2022 by Hodder. Rachel is a member of the Speakers Collective, a group of speakers with lived experience of mental health conditions. Here is my interview with Rachel Kelly. Hello, Rachel. It's so great to have you on the podcast today. And of course, I've been looking forward to getting to chat with you because from depression to recovery is such an important and interesting conversation that we'll be having today, especially for Mental Health Awareness Week. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I feel like we need to talk about the topic of mental health a lot more. So highlighting it during the Mental Health Awareness Week is such an important bit of that. And of course, you've had your very own mental health journey and your own experiences. And could you share some of what you have experienced with our listeners so they can kind of get an idea of the journey that you've been on? Sure. And yeah, absolutely. And as you say, it is Mental Health Awareness Week. And while there's been great strides in reducing stigma, there is still a lot of it around. And especially, I suppose, in what I might call my world. So my world being, I was a journalist at the Times newspaper, my husband worked in finance. So people for whom it doesn't seem obvious that you might have any mental health problems. And I think that is a kind of pocket of sort of society, you might say, where there is still quite a lot of stigma because people facing social deprivation or economic hardship, sometimes it's easier to accept they might have mental health problems. But yes, just rewinding to my own stories, we have to go back to when I'm in my early 30s and I'm in my 50s now. And at that stage, I'm working as a journalist. I'm in the newsroom at the Times newspaper. And it's an exciting job, but it's a stressful job. And often they go together. So even then, back in the 90s, 
it was 24 hours. You could be wrong by the newsroom. And I also had two small children. And I seemed to be managing, juggle, juggle, keep everything going, plates in the air. But then one night I can't get to sleep. And actually, I later learned that insomnia often is associated with mental health problems. So I'm lying there. But with this insomnia comes some quite alarming physical symptoms. So I'm lying there. My heart rate starts to speed up. I don't know if you know that thing when you have like a gym shoe in the washing machine and it's sort of going thump, thump, thump. It was a little bit like that. I could almost sort of visualize my heart jumping out of my rib cage. And I began to feel really sick, like I had to throw up. And my mind was really racing. And my thoughts were what I now realize was quite catastrophic kind of thinking, sort of basically, ah, if I don't get to sleep, I won't be able to get to work. And if I can't get to work, I'm going to lose my job. I'll lose my job. I'll lose the house. Then I'll lose the children. My whole world would basically blow up. And this sort of way of thinking, these physical symptoms, they just got worse and worse as the night wore on. I remembered at the time thinking it was a little bit like being a skater on really thin ice. I was going round and round and round. This is called rumination. And these catastrophic thoughts, they were getting deeper and darker on the ice. But remember, I'm supposed to be this quite kind of high functioning together sort of person. So the next morning I refast an activity to its normal timetable. Breakfast at break time, breakfast time, lunch at lunch time, down at dinner time. But unfortunately, these symptoms get worse and worse and feeling iller and iller. And to cut a long story short, after three days, another couple of really bad insomniac nights, I find myself in hospital. And I think I'm going to see a cardiologist because I've got this racing heart and these these thoughts I can't grip. And I imagine I'm having a heart attack. And the doctor sits me down and he says, no, he said, I'm not a cardiologist. He said, I'm a psychiatrist. And I immediately say, well, no, 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 that you've got the wrong person here. I didn't, I didn't have any problems with my mental health. He said, well, he said, these are very classic signs of a major anxiety driven, depressive episode. And so it proved. So I went to hospital and I was pretty ill for around six months. But rather amazingly, after that six months, I just went straight back to work. I didn't change anything. Amazingly, given how ill I was, I didn't take up any therapy. I didn't even really acknowledge the concept of mental health. It's a long way since that period when we didn't realize how important our psychological well-being was. But I wouldn't have done anything if I hadn't had a second major depressive episode. It was a couple of years later. It started with the insomnia, these very alarming symptoms. And that time I was ill for the best part of two years. That was about a decade ago. And I think it was after that second major period of depression that I just decided, okay, maybe somebody's trying to tell me something here. And that really began my sort of mental health journey to try and figure out what mental health was, what was going on, what was it about me that could fall into this very frightening deep, dark place. And how could I get out of it? Yeah. So that's what's led to this work. And yeah, still learning, still trying to figure it out. But yeah, learned a few things on the way, I reckon. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And as you are telling us your journey, I can't help but think in the back of my mind, how many people have symptoms, don't know that it is their mental well-being kind of tapping on the door and then just keep going until something major then happens, a second episode or a breakdown or a burnout and how we often just do not know or we cannot because we have to function for our families, for our work. We cannot take the time to even investigate. So thank you for sharing that. What an important insight (laughs) that it was tapping on the door saying, hey, there's something not quite right. But yeah, it's such a good point. I think this idea was so tough on ourselves. ourselves. Again, I didn't even have that awareness. I was just so ruthless. Like I would never be so ruthless to a friend. But I was like, get back to work, get back on that horse. And yeah, it just didn't occur to me that maybe I could find a little bit more gentleness and compassion. In a way, it was a blessing that I was ill the second time because I really had to have that message hammered home. So I suppose one of the things I feel strongly is don't do what I did. (laughs) Don't get so ill for so long. 
has led to a really interesting life. And I feel I've learned a lot, but I have a lot of regrets. I mean, for that period, I wasn't able to pick up my children from school. I had two small children and one of my sons was given this prize for bravery at his school because his mom had been absent from the school gate. There are high costs to not looking after yourself. And I don't regret what happened because it's made me who I am. But at the same time, you don't need to go the hard way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And as for your own case as well, I mean, these effects aren't just mental or emotional. They affect our families, our work life, even physically, they can have effects. You had racing heart, insomnia. If we don't pay attention, these challenges can spread to every corner of our lives and affect everything in our lives. So very important to give ourselves that grace. <laughs> you make a couple of really good points there. I mean, the first, this sort of idea of put your own oxygen mask on first before you attend to those around you. But I have had different therapy over the years. And one of the first therapists I worked with said she did like working with moms, because if you can affect the psychological well-being of a mother, you affect all those around them. And equally, when you're out of action, you're not able to look after anybody else. So it's really hard to step away from the idea that you're selfish because all the words beginning with self sound bad, self-obsessed, but actually self-care is actually about being able to be there for others. So I'd say that's a really important point. And the second point you make there is also really important. Again, I had no idea of this kind of link between the physical and the mental. And I'm not even blaming myself because this is the model of most Western medicine and it's still the case. So there's a French scientist, René Descartes, he gives this word Cartesian, the Cartesian model splitting mind and body. And actually the two are one and the same. So when you are mentally unwell, you feel very physically unwell and vice versa. There was a lot of stuff I had to learn. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of surprising how many people I speak to that say exactly that, that they didn't really become aware of that mind-body connection until much further into their journey because it just wasn't something that was presented to them in a way that they could become aware of it. So very common to just address some physical symptoms and hope that that kind of moves on. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say we were chatting earlier before we started recording. I mean, I think one thing that's changed in me is that if I'd chatted to you maybe four or five years ago, I would have talked a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy, which I have done and is still the standard approach for psychological therapy in the UK. And it's kind of about changing the way you think. And there are some virtues to it. I did personally get some benefit from it. But I think when we think about this mental physical connection, I've become more and more interested into somatic work, body work, how our feelings express themselves physically. So you know that, you know, you feel sick with fear, butterflies in your stomach, all these expressions, which are about the mind body link and being more aware of feelings and using them as a sort of GPS, as a kind of guide and allowing them and being present to them in our bodies is a big part of kind of where I've got to now in trying to understand more about this mind-body link and using it therapeutically to address the absolute centrality of that connection. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention that because many people find that when they are dealing with mental health challenges, they completely disconnect from their bodies because that becomes so overwhelming to try and manage emotions and the physical consequences that come from that headaches, nausea, body pains, anything that stems from that, that they almost just go numb because it is the only way that they can manage these challenges. So it's important to address, like you said, the somatics to really work with those emotions and not just cut them off and numb yourself to them because it's actually part of that healing journey that you'll be going on for your mental health and mental well-being. So interesting that you discovered that. Yeah, also. I think that describes me so well that I think there's a lot of fear around this. Yeah, There's fear of our feelings, the fear of overwhelm, and a kind of fear of pain. Our first instinct if something is painful is to avoid it, and jump away. And of course, that actually puts energy into stepping out of it. Whereas I'd say where I've got to now is much more being in my body, allowing pain, being with it, going with it, rather than fighting it and kind of accepting much more whatever my body 
is feeling. And that's useful information for me. But also this idea that sometimes our bodies can also provide the answer. So if you bring to mind something that makes you feel physically tense in your head, maybe a challenging relationship in your life, you will probably notice how physically tense you start to come. Then you can play that to your advantage, which is that if you can work on physical relaxation, and I'm still learning this stuff, but some of the breathing techniques so that if you can't control your racing thoughts and your racing thinking patterns, come at it the other way around. Even a 90 second slow down, just observing your reactions, your physical reactions, your emotional reactions, and using your body to help out to kind of calm down because if you're physically calm, you're more likely to be mentally calm. So I love quite a lot of the approaches like the yoga approaches and the mindful breathing approaches and just resetting that physical anxiety and then using that to help with the mental anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. Because there is this really huge connection between the mind and body, those are both so important to address. I'm curious, you are speaking about this from your perspective now, which is obviously some time past when you had that second episode where you were struggling for two years. So what did that journey look like in the beginning when you had that second episode and you were looking for answers, you were looking for healing? And how did that start? Where did you start with that healing journey? Well, I very much went down the pharmaceutical route initially. I was given a lot of medication. So I had the kind of antidepressants that slow you down. There's things like Prozac, which as you know, sort of cheer you up. Because my depression was more kind of anxiety driven. I took that kind of medication. I took sleeping pills. I did have some benzodiazepines, things like Valium, which calm you down, but you can't take them for very long. And at that stage, I was just completely obsessed, really, with that there would be a pharmaceutical answer. And I was very, very dependent on seeing doctors and, ah, when am I next going to get to see a psychiatrist? So there are long waits in the UK, as there probably are two for you guys. And that was my kind of obsession. But I say over the last 10 years, I've become more and more interested in other approaches. And I'm very careful never to dismiss medication. And I think it's a very difficult area because it's a bit like if you go to one school and people say, well, what's your school like? Well, you only know that school. Equally with medication, if you're taking medication, it's very hard to know what is having the effect. Is it the medication? Is it something else? I would never say don't take medication. I think during the acute phase, I was suicidal and I was hanging on to that medication for dear life. But I have become more and more interested in reawakening a bit of a sense of my agency. I think that's what underpins everything else I try to do. Because when you're in the medical system, as I was for many years, not to dismiss it, it's life saving, but you're always waiting for somebody else. You always need that appointment, that okay, can I adjust my medication? Could I come a few milligrams off, a little bit of this, a little bit of that? And I do think that for me, feeling that I could make a difference, that I could empower myself was a big part of the healing. Because I do think that mental health problems happen within a context, like all illnesses, even certain kinds of diabetes, if we eat too much sugar, we're more vulnerable. And I think we have to hold on to the fact that we can change our own environment. And I think one of the big shifts that's only happened fairly recently is that if you'd asked me 10 years ago, why was I so ill? I'd say, well, it's really stressful and the newsroom and small children and my husband and blah, 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 blah. And it was true. It was a stressful environment. But there was also something about how I chose to respond to that. I think that's probably something that's underpinned a lot of more recent approaches I've had is can I get that sense of empowerment, a little bit of a sense of agency that I can make a difference? And I think that has been a big part of healing for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be very disempowering to be in the medical system at certain times. That is definitely, I think, a very common experience. So finding that empowerment and self-advocating and taking your health also into your own hands. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have to exclude 
like you said, any of the other avenues that are being offered to you, but it does give you another option to actually take care of yourself. So wonderful yeah. that you found that as well. And did you find this on your own or was this part of the therapies and the medical system that you went through or did you start finding these approaches on your own? No, I've had an awful lot of help. I mean, I was lucky because I did write about this very severe experience. I wrote a book called Black Rainbow. And at that stage of very severe mental illness, I was turning a lot to very wonderful poetry, some religious poetry, just to kind of get through that crisis. I wrote this book. And then as a result, I was terribly lucky because I then got to work alongside a bunch of mental health charities, finding other people in this situation. So I'm an ambassador for Rethink Mental Illness in the UK and for SANE. And I got chatting to people and then chatting to both people who were suffering, but also kind of experts that were trying to help them. And probably the most influential person has been a recent therapist. And again, this is only in the last few years who I've been speaking to. And she came up with this very obvious point, but I don't know why it took me so long to figure this out. This idea that your main relationships with yourself we all spend more time with ourselves, with our feelings, with our thoughts, with our stories than with anybody else. And again, once you've got this idea, it's actually quite empowering because if it's about our relationship with ourselves, that's something we can work on. And I think that talking about the medical profession, you nailed it. It's not an either or, but I think that my own relationships with psychiatrists and mental health professionals, I think I'm more of the view that I am my own expert too. I am the expert on myself. And yes, you're great. You're seeing me for a 30 minute slot, but I live with myself all day, every day. And just kind of having a bit of confidence and learning that kind of self awareness and what makes me feel light? Where do I feel easy? Who am I finding are supportive? And where can I line up a little bit more with what feels good and just every day? lining up more and more and more with what feels easy. So that kind of somatic awareness and not feeling guilt trip that there's anything wrong <laughs> with spending this little bit of time. I think that was a big thing to get over. Yeah, especially when it comes to mental health challenges, because they're not visible like a broken arm or a broken leg. You know, you have a cast on, people know there's something going on. But because of this invisibility very often of mental health challenges, I think it makes it difficult to have to explain yourself, to have to defend why you are not feeling well. People just can't see it. So it's not so very obvious. And there's a lot of guilt around, well, I don't really have a visible thing going on with me. So I have to kind of justify why I'm feeling this way or why I need time off or time to recover. So a part of it makes it very difficult with mental health challenges because of that. It's so difficult because it's not like any other area of ill health because we don't have diagnostic tests. You can't get a blood test. There's no MRI scan that can show what's going on. As you say, it's both the sort of self-doubt and then the doubt of the people around you. And it's really hard. It's a really hard right now because what I've noticed is that since I first got involved working in mental health, that Back in 2014, when I wrote this book about my own very severe experiences of ill health, there was kind of like, oh, you're so brave. You're so courageous to come out. And it was a little bit like brave, maybe foolhardy, but it was still a feeling that it was still a kind of relatively new area to be open about what was going on. And it's almost like we're now facing a bit of a backlash. People feel we've gone possibly too far with awareness and we're over medicalizing ordinary human unhappiness, which is Freud's phrase. I think it's a very confusing period for a lot of people. What is every day and what is a severe problem? It's very hard to know where you sit on that spectrum. Yeah, exactly. And especially is your reaction to something problematic just because it's different than someone else's or other people's reactions, especially when we talk about grief or we talk about sadness or anxiety, right? What is a normal response nowadays with the world being in chaos and so upside down, can we even really judge that anymore of what's normal and what's not? Everything is so different. And we've had to relearn, even as a world population, how things are in the world again. It's <laughs> the pandemic. Now we have wars. How do we even measure or judge that? 
Yeah. And I think you've landed on something which I've been thinking of a lot about recently is this judgment thing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of right, wrong narratives around, including within mental illness. So you're wrong or you're right, or it's wrong to think of it like this, or it's right to think of it like that. And I think that one approach that I found really helpful is just trying to step away from judgment more broadly across a lot of metrics, across a lot of political views, a lot of views around what was happening in the pandemic, views around mental health, and just to step away from right, wrong, and more like understanding difference. And difference isn't wrong, but allowing difference and just becoming, again, that kind of self-awareness of just observing your own reaction. Because when we make other people wrong, we make ourselves wrong. So in a way, we are the main victims of a lot of judgment around what we perceive to be right and what we perceive to be wrong. So I think I hold on to a lot the sort of idea of just watching if you're stepping into judgment and just allowing, okay, people's experience is very different and just allowing that, being with it and being easy with it. Yeah, absolutely. We also have a lot of different cultural backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds and I think we need to be a bit more graceful when it comes to ourselves and others to allow, like you said, for those differences to be because we didn't all grow up the same way. We didn't all have the same experiences, but who are we to say whether that is right or wrong? So to just really allow for that, to allow for that to take place, it'll enrich our own experience as well in that sense. One thing I'm doing, which I've only recently came across this technique with a therapist I work with, which I really like, is this idea of identify your shark music. And by that, I mean, if you recall the film Jaws, there's that music, which is like, you start to feel really frightened and a lot of feelings are coming up. I think that in conversation, you can just, again, step back and just build that self-awareness about what's happening to you right now. What shark music are you hearing? And it could go back a very long way. It could be something to do with how you were brought up. Of A big one for me is fear of rejection. So I will do almost anything not to be rejected. And this is understandable from a sort of evolutionary point of view. We have to be included in the tribe to survive. But I also like the idea of your main relationships with yourself. Well, as long as you don't reject yourself, no one can truly reject you. But again, I notice this sharp music pop up. If someone disagrees with me very strongly, instead of thinking they're just different, I think, oh, I'm wrong. I'm being rejected. Anyway, just listening out, like what shark music is playing for you? And can you just stop and attend to that person who's feeling scared? Maybe it's back to being a child or whatever it is. Come back to calm. Maybe use some of that somatic work we were talking about just to get yourself back into kind of equilibrium before you re-engage. So those sorts of things I'm finding really helpful. Yeah, it's quite a shift because, as I say, when I first was trying to figure out what was going on, it was much more about blaming the world around me. Yeah. And if we don't have other tools, that might be the first go to until we learn different tools to help ourselves and to work with. So I love that, by the way, the shark music. (laughs) So I hope our listeners can take that into their own lives also and try that out for themselves. I think that's a really great (laughs) comparison there that you made. Another little one that I'm using a lot at the moment because of this kind of idea of the mind-body link and the somatic connection, it's a really simple thing. And what you do is you just rub your finger and thumb together in a very gentle, easy way. And then you say a positive statement. It has to be kind of like a positive statement. So I could say, like, I'm really enjoying this podcast. And in fact, I know we're not on film, but my thumb and finger is moving really easily. And then what you do is you bring to mind something that is a bit more challenging. So I'm thinking of somebody with whom I have a difficult relationship, challenging relationship, maybe one for my own psychological growth, but I'm bringing this person to mind and I'm saying, I find it really easy to get along with this particular person and my thumb and finger have completely stuck. It's just a really useful way of just lining up with your physicality and what you really feel. And there are so many messages around us. And in a way, I might be shooting myself in the foot here, but a lot of experts telling us what to do and what to feel and how we should and shouldn't do this or that and what is the best way. I think for me, it's about trusting yourself, coming back to your own instincts and just finding little tools to line up with what you really feel. So it's a nice one to use if you want to just 
see if you're at ease physically with what you're saying. So it's that kind of thoughts thinking, which is our world. We're always in our heads and our thoughts. But hey, what does our body really say here? Yeah, that's a good one. And I think also, as you mentioned before, that if there are people who know that they are people pleasers or they like to avoid conflict because that is part of their mental health journey, that's a great way for them to check in whether what they've just said to somebody was to please or whether it's aligned with what they're actually feeling in their body and what they're wanting. So that's really great. I love that. <laughs> and actually, as a parent, I don't know if you've got any mums and dads out there, but I noticed it was really affecting my parenting. So I had real problems with boundaries and being authoritative rather than authoritarian. And one of the reasons I found it really hard to say that's not okay is that I wanted to be liked. If I look back now, why did I have those big breakdowns? Well, I wanted to be the good employee. I wanted to be the good mom, the good wife, the good this, the good that. I didn't ever want anybody to not like me. So I wasn't prepared to say, well, actually, this is too much. I can't write news stories at 10 at night and then feed the baby and then get up for work and then go for a, I don't know, a work dinner. It's too much. But I was too frightened of being able to say, actually, you might not like this, but that's okay. I'm yeah. lining up with my reality, my expertise, my psychological well-being. And actually, in the wrong run, that's better for everybody else. It's not yeah. a selfish thing to do. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. I think that is difficult to learn, to set boundaries, to has to maybe do with some self-worth also, right? That we learn our own worth in certain situations and in our lives that we trust that, we trust our intuition. So yeah, really important as part of yeah. that healing journey <laughs> to discover those things. And now you have written several books. You are a keynote speaker, you're a presenter, you're here on the podcast, obviously. <laughs> you are a speaker in many different places and venues. You're also present online. So what are some of the ways that our listeners could connect with you and where can they find your books also? This is sort of like the dreamy question that all writers hope to hear. Yes, I've written one book called The Happy Kitchen, Good Mood Food. It's in the US as well with Simon and Schuster. That one's actually called The Happiness Diet. I was interested in the contribution to nutrition. I've written about poetry, how that can help us. I wrote a book called You'll Never Walk Alone, the, the poems to hold tight. When you're feeling vulnerable, allowing that and poems to help you through as well. I wrote my own story, which is called Black Rainbow. Yeah, I'm working on a book about parenting at the moment because I realized so much more about how we are affects our children. That hasn't come out yet. And I'm on Instagram. I think it's Rachel F. Kelly. And I just share little reels and things that have struck me that I'm using, that I'm finding helpful. Yeah, I have a website with a lot of information on that. And yeah. You can find me online. Yeah, Rachel Kelly. I'm around. <laughs> Amazing. And we will be linking to all of Rachel's offerings in the show notes as well. So be sure to check there on how you can connect with her. And of course, thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us for this Mental Health Awareness Week special because we want to keep the conversation around mental health going. We want to know how we can help ourselves, how we can manage, how we can move forward through and thrive in our own mental well-being. So thank you so very much for joining us today, Rachel. My total pleasure. And here's to us all keeping this conversation going. Absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. Take care. All right. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen in. If you enjoy the Journey podcast, please support us by subscribing, sharing on social media and leaving us a review. We appreciate you. And you can find more of The Journey on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and our website, thejourney.com. Sending you love and courage and see you next time.